You are now listening to the A Dose of Disruption podcast, powered by Experian. Weekly compelling conversations on making money moves and growing your network. The place where you can learn to be you and do you all at the same time. I'm your host, Shelly Bell. And now, let's see what this week's Level Up looks like. Hey, what's up, y'all? And we're back. Okay, did you disrupt something last week? If not, then I empower and encourage you to do one. Disrupt something this week. All right, disrupt something. Um, let's get into the Shelly Bree. Shelly Bree. All right, here we go. So I at Black Girl Ventures, we've been looking for a, a marketing agency, right? Today's Shelly Brief is gonna be a little different because it's gonna be like a, a testimonial kind of situation, I guess. Not uh, anyway, just stay t- just Keep listening. So I reach out, you know, a friend of mine, uh, uh, she actually not a friend of mine, our COO, she is a friend of mine, but our COO, she's like, oh, this agency, they got, you know, ad week gave them agency of the year last year. We should talk to them. Okay. We should definitely work with them. I would love to work with them. They're down in Richmond. It's called the Martin Agency. Now, today's Shelly Brief is going to be a lesson in um, don't count my coins. Okay. (laughs) Don't count my coins because I'm black. Lesson. All right. So here we go. So I, I'm like, okay, so this is doing like, uh, the holiday season's kind of coming on or whatever. So she's like, well, they're probably out. So let's just wait to the new year to contact them. I said, no, you know, I'm going to contact them now because if I'm going to work with an agency, I want to see how do they work when they're supposedly like out, like, let's see, like, we got our social media is is uh, very important to us. So we can't go a week without any posts. So like we got to let's see how they work. So she said, OK, so I, she did some connecting on her side. People she knew connected us to the Martin agency on one side. Right. Like through people, you know, I decided let me just do a cold outreach and see how this experience goes. So I go I, I call them. <laughs> The lady answers the phone. The Martin agency, and she kind of sounded like uh, if you watch Power, she's kind of sounded like Tommy's mom. Um, and she's like the Martin agency. I said, "Hi, my name is Shelly Bell. I'm from the Black Girl Ventures Foundation, and I want to inquire about how to work with you." And she said, "Oh, so um, I mean, if you you could probably go to the website and put your resume. You know, look at the jobs we have available." And then, get, and then, you know, down, but that, send us your resume. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm looking to hire you. She said, you looking to hire me? <laughs> I said, you're the marketing agency, right? And she said, oh, you looking to hire the marketing agency? Uh, yes. Okay. First of all, you answering the phone for the marketing agency. Okay. Now, I said work with you. I didn't say work for you. Now, I don't know if it was because of the like, the my voice sounds raspy, so I must be black or a black girl ventures. I ain't even gonna throw it on that. I'm just gonna say she just had a misunderstanding. But by the time we got to the, okay, no, I wanna hire you. And she's like, you wanna hire me? I'm thinking, lady, what are you doing? Are you on the toilet right now? Like, what the hell? Like. I'm calling to hire this agency. <laughs> like, I didn't call to talk to you. I don't know you, right? So, okay. She finds, she's like, she puts me on hold. Then she comes back, she's like, ooh, you know, I'm gonna connect you to this person. Like, as if she was doing me a favor. So she connected me to somebody, went to a voicemail. I left the message. They have not contacted me, contacted me back to this day. And that was before Christmas. In December, but before Christmas. But whatever, other end, Shonda is making waves through her end, connecting me to people. So she connects me to a person that connects me to a person. And I won't call the person's name at this, at the Martin agency. I'll, I'll just leave it at someone who is considered to be in a high position at the Martin agency. So, you know, he's like, cool. He takes a call. Um, you know, he's, he's like, cool. He jumps in, which is awesome. And I want to commend him and any other employees that when you get these soft introductions, you actually act on them. Because there is business on the other side and there could potentially be business for the Martin agency on the other side. But the way we've been treated was just it, it was it's unfortunate and the customer service is terrible. So we hop on, you know, the guy, me and, and my senior multimedia manager, we're on with him. 
We give him everything we're looking for. He asks us questions. We tell him about Black Girl Ventures. We tell him everything we're looking for, everything we're trying to do, everything we want in the agency. He talks to us about like they work with, um, you know, Geico and they work with big accounts and they do these things, these things. I had to hop off later um, because I had to go to a meeting. So later I talked to my multimedia manager and I'm like, hey, what, um, how did it go? He's like, it was good, but I get the impression that he thinks we can't afford it. And I'm like, why would he think that? It's not his job to think about what I can afford. You know, it is his job to present what I need to afford and then give me the space to have to afford it. Considering this is where I think people, for in my opinion, he did not honor the way he got introduced to us, right? So whoever this person is that introduced him to us, in my opinion, that's a disrespect on him, right? Because you should respect that if the person who introduced you, they're, they're not going to introduce you to anybody that's going to come that can't afford you. Considering that the person that introduced us used to work for the Martin Agency as well, I believe. And in that case, you would think that he would honor that and say, well, they, well, they must know what they're doing because this person's introducing them. Or well, they must have had a budget because this person's introducing them. And so this is where I do feel like it was because we're Black. Um, because he didn't ask us anything about budget. Like, that's not a conversation that, we, that I had with him and I managed the budget. So how are you counting my coins to say that to feel or even give any sentiment on what I may or may not be able to afford? Okay. Moving on. So, um, we get there. So, okay. He doesn't, but he, no response after that. So we're following up, following up, no response. I'm sending messages. My multimedia manager is sending messages. No response. Following up, following up. No response. No response. So finally, he's in. He sends an email. Says he has some personal and professional things going on. He did apologize. Um, and then, but then, what got me is, then he asked me to send him a brief of every. So at the end of the last call that was back in December, he was supposed to send us the capabilities that they have. Well. When he came back this time, after several re us reaching out several times, wanting to work with him, he says, well, send me a, a brief that includes everything you're needing, your budget range, your goals, all, all these things. And then we'll send you the capabilities. Now, I'm offended by that because then why did my time is precious? You wasted my time on a call for me to give you everything that you asked me for. Right now, you should be sending me your capabilities or your statement of work. And in my opinion, this is a disrespect. So you go to the Martin Agency website and it's like, we care about visibility. We care about, you know, and they got all these black people on the website. Now, the dude we talking to is black as well. However, to me, what you're communicating is we care about helping not black agents. Agent, we care about helping corporations that are not black actually speak to black people and that's how we can get our money what that doesn't mean that you care about creating visibility for black organizations that have the cap that can have the capital to work with you so i go back and i'm like hey you know as far as you know budget we we plan to be able to do this i'm paraphrasing you know we got partnerships with large entities like nike and visa like we're prepared to hire an agency you know my experience with the martin agency has not been great First, I'm, I'm asked if I want to work for you. Then you're asking me to send you a full creative brief before you even send me your capabilities. Now, I'm going to give some, some space and grace because we're in a pandemic. Um, so if you can send over the capabilities, we can move from there. So he comes back. You know, no, like, oh, I'm sorry, you have this experience with Martin H.C., none of that. He sends me a, um, comes back and copies and pastes from the website, basically, their capabilities. Well, and you can also find us on the website. You know, here it is, but you could, you could look it up on the website. I said, okay, I'm looking for full social media management and PR. And I haven't heard from him since. But, you know, I just don't feel like if I were a, a white corporation or white company or agency that he would have, that we would have been treated that way. I just don't. And, and I could be wrong. And y'all can, y'all can send me a note on, on social media and tell me, Shelly, I don't think that's the case. They just got terrible customer service overall. How is Ad Week making you agency of the year, but you got terrible customer service? So I got questions for Ad Week. So, uh, in fact, I want this to be the part of the clip that we use, Matt, for, um, <laughs> for when we do the teaser to say, 
How is Ad Week making the Martin Agency 2020 Agency of the Year when they have terrible customer service? And as a woman of color, I've been treated like the first question they asked me when I called to reach out to hire them is, do I, is oh, do I am I look submit my resume? Then the second conversation we have is, you know, a good one. Third conversation we have, I, without them sending me their capabilities or a statement of work, I'm being asked to do all the work. Like, I just don't feel like as an agency, I don't feel like if I was not a person of color, I would have been treated that way. And to look at their website, to see that they have all these people of color on and we care about visibility and blah, blah, blah. Again, for me, you know, I, don't, I can't say based off of my experience that you care about actually working with people of color um, or black people. What I can say is that you care that corporations who hire you get to show, get to look like they work with people of color. So to say the least, I am actually really unhappy with that. And um, I'm going to see what happens next, because, again, space and grace. This man could be under super stress. He could be it could be a lot he's dealing with right now. So I'm going to get space and grace. But don't count my coins. Don't assume that I can't pay you. We we have a budget for this. I would not reach out to you if I didn't have a budget for this. Now, if we decide we're not a good fit, that's one thing. But until you give me a quote or a statement of work, don't count my coins. All right. Okay, speaking of transference of power and like how and talking about like including community and what it means to uplift live voices, our guest for today is Tebow Mannequin. He is the co-founder of Seawall and he uh is the has a podcast called Larger Than Yourself and a book coming out soon. So let's hear from Tebow. Let's talk to him about what it really means to include more people every day. Let's go. Super excited for my guest today, Tebow. You know what? Your name, Tebow is such an awesome name that I don't even say your last name, even when I might be referring to how awesome you are. <laughs> but I'll let you, I'll let you, Tebow Mannequin, is that correct? It is correct, yeah. And 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 it te- there there are, there are I have not met another Tebow, so the the, the last name is insignificant. <laughs> well, it's it's really awesome to have you. And uh, I w- I had the opportunity to um, interview with Tebow his podcast, Larger Than Yourself, and it's such an amazing experience. And you're such an amazing energy. So I'm I'm excited to just hear more about your story since you got the opportunity to ask me all the questions. Um, so I want to, I'll start with, how did you get here? And you could be doing anything in the world. You could be, you know, weaving baskets. You could be, you know, managing, uh, professional athletes. You could be, you know, operating the stoplights behind the scenes. (laughs) You could be doing a number of things. Why, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Like, how did you get here? Yeah. So I got here and we got connected through podcasts because I've spent the last four years writing a book. Um, and the book is called Larger Than Yourself. Um, and it follows these kind of like fascinating stories that I've had over the past 20 years of my professional career from uh, moving to South Africa in my very early 20s and helping to launch an international nonprofit that would use sports to bridge severely divided countries, getting kids from really young ages playing basketball in South Africa together and uh, white and black kids at post-apartheid in the Middle East and in Northern Ireland and Cyprus and really all over the world, which then led me back to my hometown of Baltimore, where we launched this company called Seawall. And I'm sure we're going to dive into all of these things. Um, But what I realized along the way um, is that we really have responsibilities to help grow ideas. And how we grow those ideas um, and how we bring those ideas to life uh, will determine how successful they end up being. And there's a whole way to do that um, that kind of I've observed. And I've just been kind of like taking notes and those notes turn into chapters and the chapters into a book that I'm so stoked that it's coming out. It'll be out a little bit later this year. Um, And it really talks about uh, our responsibilities as social entrepreneurs to reimagine industries, challenge the status quo get out of our comfort zones um, and really look at leadership in a completely different way. Awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about the story behind the story, right? Um, This is awesome and all great in who you are, have become and are becoming. Take us back to, you know, right before the decision to do 
uh, the nonprofit work? Like right before that, what were you doing? Did you, you know, when you grew up, you're like, when I grow up, I want to start a nonprofit that changes the world. Like, what was your, when I want to, when I grow up story, I'm going to be a thing. So, so Shelly, I have two very distinct memories um, from going back to even when I was a really little kid, right? One of them was I was about eight or nine years old and I was watching the movie Mississippi Burning with my parents mm -hmm. in our family living room. I don't know if you remember that movie. Mm -hmm. It takes place in the Deep South, a um, uh, civil rights lawyer. Uh, and um, I remember there was a scene where this white mob of Ku Klux Klan attacked this black church, um, killed a bunch of people, hung people, kicked young children. And I just lost it. And I sprinted up to my room and I buried my head in my pillow and I was hysterically crying. It was the first time I remember questioning why the color of people's skin keeps them apart and what the differences are um, that have been insurmountable for us as human beings. And I couldn't understand it. And I cried and I cried and my mom and dad came in and they tried to like t talk to me, but I, like, I wasn't in a position to even receive anything at that point. And from that moment on, almost every day of my life, I've tried to understand what it is that keeps us apart as human beings and what brings us together. The second really formative experience I had was that probably at like 10 years old, maybe a couple of years later, um, there was a program called Hands Across America, for those of you guys old enough to remember it. And at 10, I didn't remember anything. I just remember my dad putting us in the family station wagon and driving us to some place off of 95, some major highway in, in Baltimore. Um, and we parked and we got out and we held hands with people from as far as you could see. And I don't remember if they actually connected hands across the entire country, but in my head, that's what they were trying to do. So why was it, I remember asking myself at 10 years old, what was it that brought millions and millions of people together for one purpose at one moment in time? right? Um, what was this movement that had been, that had been created? Um, and it was kind of those two formative experiences that had me always questioning what can bring us together as human beings. Um, and what are these powers that create these movements that make us want to participate in them? And, you know, from there, like, you know, I wasn't a particularly good student. Um, I wasn't in particularly like driven. I didn't know in college or in high school what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I just knew that I wanted to do some sort of work that had me continue to wrestle and begin to understand these questions that I had, you know, that had been implanted in my head and my heart from such a young age. Um, and I think that all of that has led to this work that I've been doing for all of these years. That's amazing. I think what is the experience like um, after seeing something like Mississippi burning, which, you know, in eight or nine years old could be a lot for anyone. It, but it's, it, it's a truth that's a lot for anyone um, to try and digest. And then what then in the moment at eight or nine or between, you know, outside of like starting the bigger movements, how does that practically play out in like going back to school the next day? You know, or like that Monday or, um, you know, what does that look like when you decide to go to college or not or decide to, you know, go, hell, even to the grocery store? <laughs> you know, like, what is it like? I think it's interesting because like for, for me, right, on this end, I, you know, I'm angered. Um, it's interesting because I don't know that I feel sad as much as I feel anger. And and I might as well, after watching any of the movies, Rosewood, um, you know, things like Mississippi Burning, um, you know, like all the different layers of the move, different movies. I remember growing up being just angry for days, like, you know, or just being like, I don't even want to talk to any white people. Right. Like after this, you know, I, I don't I don't even want to encounter anyone. Right. And anyone that, that could potentially be any descendant of this uh, kind of behavior. And of course, that's not, you know, realistic and you don't, you can't 
you know, walking around with that anger for everyone and you can't, you know, you have to uh, really figure out where you want to place it, you know? And I think, it, you know, considering the way you looked at that particular thing and then went out and did your th this thing you're doing. And I looked at the same thing and then went out and did this thing I'm doing, right? And it is like perfect alignment for just how the world can change. And we need both of those efforts to happen. But we never really talk about like, well, what internally is actually happening to us? Stress, the stress of that, you know, like the stress of that going to school the next day after either the person who is the person who would be the, the somewhat victim in that movie versus the person who would be a part of the people who are the oppressors in that movie. And from a different standpoint of not like just the empathetic place of being like, I, we both want to have empathy for our, for our people. And for me, our people is not about color, race, gender, any of that for me. And so the Hands Across America story, that's like meeting up with your people. Doesn't matter what color the hands are. Doesn't matter how if it's a man hand, woman hand, kid hand. You know, what matters is that the people were there. Um, so, so as you've gone on this journey to, to, to challenge the status quo, um, what have you practically felt? Like, do you are you a spiritual person? Do you, um, you know, with your body, how do you practice, manage, kind of like? balance these 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 things i think we hear a lot about how we balance this people of color we don't even hear that because we don't really i don't know if we have a place to balance it to be honest <laughs> you know you don't have the capacity or the space or the like you know you're going to watch that and then walk outside and encounter you know people that may mirror what you just you know any type of sentiments on the news on the, like it's a constant bombarding of images that you don't always have the capacity to do anything else. What are some of your like management, self care, balancing acts that you've had to have while you are on this journey to challenge yourself? Status quo. And I know that was a lot, but I wanted, wanted to un just unfold that a little bit um, to prop up the space to say, how can we learn from each other on how we manage the reaction to? Um, terrible things that may happen in the world. So look, we, we, we have two options when we see something. We can see it and act on it, um, or we can pretend like we never saw it and move on. And there's something genetically within me that um, I'm not able to unsee something. You know, once I've seen it, it becomes a part of my heart and it, 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 it lives in my body. Um, and it inspires this like deep curiosity. So the, you know, I don't, it's impossible to think back to at eight years old, what right, that right, right. triggered in the moment. But what I do know is that it inspired this curiosity. You know, I grew up in like a privileged white bubble, right? So that was the first time that caused me to ask myself, what is a privileged white bubble? Mm -hmm. Like, why, um, why do I live in a bigger house than my black friends, right? Um, why do I go to, uh, why is the school that I go to, this, what, this private school, um, what, what, why do I, why does my mom pick me up and, the, um, and some of my other friends have to ride the, the, the bus back home? Um, and it allowed me to begin to like ask those questions throughout my life, right? And find, uh, begin to find the answers of what we do with that privilege um, that that we have um, and, and how we act on it. Right. So, you know, for, for me, I, I've met a lot of people throughout the word stress. Right. And that's just like that's nothing that that's that hasn't been a part of my vocabulary mm. because I, I am I am a deeply like spiritual person um, when it comes to really processing information. You know, like mm. I firmly believe that everything happens and comes to us for a reason. So at any given day, at any given time, I get a ton of no's, you know, we come up with all these ideas and like everyone's throwing no's back. This will never work. This can't happen. I get bad news all of the time. I was just deported. I live in Brazil right now. 
Um, and I showed up to the airport with my wife and my two kids back to Sao Paulo as we were coming back from a visit here in Baltimore. And the federal police wouldn't let me into the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my two kids are looking at me with like huge eyes and my wife's like almost crying and like they're being allowed to move through immigrations, but like they've held me back. And, you know, I had this like peaceful feeling that like, while I would love to be going through the gate with my family, there's some reason that I'm not being allowed into this country at this moment in time, you know? And like, while I don't know what that reason is, like I'm fully aware of it. Um, and I embrace and I'm curious to figure out what that reason is going to be once it comes to me, you know, I'm several days into it. It, ha it hasn't come to me why I'm not with my family right yet. Um, but, you know, I, I really do believe that, that spiritually, like all these things that happen to us, good or bad, um, are here to teach us lessons and make us stronger. Yeah, I love that. That's so awesome. So so speaking of that, you know, it's the perfect time to jump into um, seawall development and and what that has meant for, for this journey. You know, one more question though. So challenging the status quo is, is interesting. And I, I, I see, I do the same. I, that could be definitely listed as something that is on the Shelly Bell things to do every day. Um, <laughs> but what happens when the places where status quo has been challenged become the status quo? Um, do we just wait for the next disruptors? Do we try to stay conscious of what we're actually pushing to be status quo? Like, you know, is there a difference between status quo norms and, you know, just socially adapted? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think we can never let ourselves get to places where we feel comfortable, you know, where we're on cruise control. The moment that we let that begin to take over is the moment that we stop innovating. You know, challenging the status quo is just about thinking and looking at things differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that nothing ever feels permanent in nature, right? Like even marriage and relationship, you know, I have an amazing marriage, you know, but it has been hard work, you know, and we could have gone through the motions and as most people that do and just assume that this is what marriage looks like. And it was actually my wife that called me out on it maybe two or three years ago. And she was like, we are going through the motions and this relationship is status quo and you're not a status quo guy and I'm not a status quo girl. Um, how did we end up in this position? Um, mm. So um, I think we can't take anything for granted. I think everything has to constantly be challenged. Everything, every assumption we have, especially when we begin to feel comfortable, that's when we know that uh, um, we, we need to start asking those questions, going back to that place of curiosity. Yeah, I love that because people, people ask me like, how do you stay so certain, right? Like out of all the pivots you've done, places you've changed, which, how do you stay so certain? And my answer is my imagination. <laughs> you know, I imagine that there's something that can happen here, you know, and it's like, I imagine that I could be the person that could do it. And then I actually don't need but like two Facebook likes and I'm out, you know, like, <laughs> like I put it on Facebook and like, oh, two likes. Yep. That, now I should do it. Um, but, you know, if I needed external validation, I don't I don't need a whole lot of it. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I love that so much. So let's talk about Seawall. Um, and how did you view yourself challenging the status quo with it? Like, what is, what did that mean in, in creating Seawall? So look, I, um, for six years of my life, I lived out of a suitcase, um, traveling from country to country all over the world to the most divided countries that exist on this planet, right? Spent a lot of time in the Middle East in Israel and in Palestine, in South Africa, uh, in Northern Ireland, in Cyprus, and all these countries where um, literally people are like, have had to build walls between communities to keep themselves apart. And in my travels, I'd come back around the holidays to kind of catch up with my family. And I had this like nagging thing that was beginning to bother me, right? And it was this idea that America was this like perfect melting pot. Um, as we've told ourselves we are, as we've told the world that we are. Um, 
And, and I had this realization that we really weren't as united as we had claimed to be. And we had an inability to talk about our differences in the way, in an open and honest way, the way so many of these other countries had. You know, if you're in South Africa, you were either white or black, right? And you were having like very honest conversations. You're not sugarcoating it. If you're in the Middle East, you're Israeli, either Israeli or Palestinian, and there's intense feelings with that. Um, but each side owns those feelings and is able to talk about them, right? In mm. a super open way. And what I had realized in all these travels is that the real estate industry is the most powerful connected industry on the planet. It literally touches every single one of us, every single moment of every single day. The homes that we live in, the streets that we drive on, the parks that we play in, the shops that we shop in are all connected through this mostly silent web of real estate. But as the most powerful connected industry on the planet, it's done more to separate us and keep us apart than bring us together. And that realization was mind blowing to me. How is this possible? Right. You've got this power and this strength that's been used to divide us as human beings. And I saw it in the um, townships in South Africa where the white apartheid regime took all of the blacks and threw them into informal settlements with one road in and one road out. I saw it in the Middle East with the fight over land. I saw it in Northern Ireland with, between the 40 foot high peace walls between the Protestant and the Catholic communities. Um, and I came back to Baltimore, you know. Um, which is the city that I thought I knew. And I started driving around and I ended up in a part of town that I was made to believe I didn't belong in, mm. that I wouldn't be safe in, um, that people that looked like me shouldn't spend time in. It was the narrative that I had grown up hearing. Um, but we talked about not being able to unsee something. Mm. I had seen the power of not listening to that narrative all over the world to going into communities on both sides mm. and having those complicated conversations. And I wanted to begin to have it in my own country and in my own hometown of Baltimore. Mm. And I had just had this like epiphany there. And I began to like think back to like redlining, right? Which I had learned about in high school, but I thought it was a thing of the past. But sitting in the community that I was in that day that had very few opportunities for upward mobility, that didn't have the infrastructure that I would have benefited from in the neighborhoods that I grew up in. I realized that it was, it was the real estate industry that needed to get reimagined. So I got with my dad, who was like a hero of mine. Um, and I said, dad, you know, I, I want to launch a company. I want it to be a real estate company. Um, and I want to reimagine what buildings in the built environment can actually do for us as human beings. I want every project that we work on um, to find ways to empower the communities that it's in to find creative ways to unite the cities that we work in um, and to find really creative ways to empower um, people with great ideas who just need help through buildings to get those ideas started. And that was the beginning of the launch of Seawall. And look, like it rolls off the tongue now, right? Some 15 years later, it wasn't quite that pretty in the moment, but um, that was the beginning of the, of the trajectory. And I love that because one of the things you're doing is uh, you're mentoring black developers. Is that right? It is. Yes. Yeah. And so I think that's so key because a couple of parts of things about a real estate industry that where people get left out is not ever getting equity if they don't have enough capital or don't understand how to move or make or go into a deal um, where they don't have to have all the capital. Right. Because I think like there, I think the, the 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 messages that come about out about real estate, I think to certain communities is well, you you got to have the money. If you don't have the money to pay, then you can't play. If you don't have the money to buy a whole building, which is like so ridiculous. <laughs> but like if you don't have a money as if you had to have it all on your own. Right. Which is not how it works a lot of the times Whereas like, oh, do you if you don't have all the money to pay for all the things. Now, I remember sitting down with a developer um, and being like, well, how does this work exactly? So how do I, you know, all of these advertisements on on the radio about like, oh, no, get into the real estate industry, you know, take it, you know, come. And then and then all these different ways that you can do it is not common knowledge. It's not as commonly talked about um, in the places where kids grow up. Right. So like if your family didn't own real estate. You're probably not talking about it around your dinner table. 
and they're not it's not a class like your finance class in high school is how to manage for retirement you know it's not how to own a property it's not how to buy a mixed-use building and live at the top of it it's not you know how to how to buy um you know a multi-unit property like those are not conversations that you have what has been um some of your most rewarding moments while in the in the while you've been working on seawall um look uh you know we're such a purpose-driven company and the work that we've set out to do the our first few projects were all about helping teachers find affordable collaborative apartments to live together in um, and nonprofits focused on kids and education to be able to operate under one roof and share ideas and passion and resources and things like that so you know i'll, I'll our, I'll never forget our first project. We ended up buying a hundred thousand square foot, hundred and twenty year old vacant, collapsing old factory building in a part of Baltimore that every single person told us we were crazy to even think about investing in. Let alone investing in a way where we were going to develop apartments for teachers at like half the price of what market rent would be and office space for nonprofits uh, also at significant discounts and ended up being called the Center for Educational Excellence. And mm. everybody bet against us. Everybody told us that there's no way that this would work and this would be the worst decision we ever made, including my mom, who's also a hero of mine, uh, who told my dad that of all of the dumb things he's ever done, if he tried to pull this off, this would be the dumbest and refused to sleep in the same bed with him for like a week while we like contemplated the opportunity. But you know, when like you've fallen in love with something, um, there's like all reason and logic kind of go flying out the window. Um, and we understood that this opportunity to create this amazing space for the people who are doing the most important work in our cities, focused on kids and education. Um, we realized that that opportunity um, wasn't ours and that idea wasn't ours. Um, it belonged to the teachers who had been suggesting to that that to us quietly behind the scenes. Mm. Um, and so we started to bring in these focus groups of teachers and we toured them through the collapsing old warehouse. And they were the first group that came in and said, guys, this isn't a bad idea. This is an amazing idea. And like, where do we start? And so we enlisted those teachers and they worked with the design team and they designed their own apartments and they chose their own amenities. Mm. Shelly, we let them choose their own rent, you know? Wow. Um, and it's amazing. And this is the book talks so much about this when you transfer ownership, right? Mm -hmm. Too many times as entrepreneurs, especially at the early stage, we try to take credit for the idea. Yeah. You know, um, this is what I am working on. This is what I am doing. Um, when the reality of is these ideas that we bring to life, they've always existed. They've been sitting there on the tip of the universe's tongue waiting to be brought to life. Yeah. Our role is to inclusively help bring them to life, but make sure that dozens or hundreds or thousands of people feel the same sense of pride of ownership and authorship in what's getting created because when that happens a movement starts so anyway like these teachers and these nonprofits have this active seat at the table we made sure that the neighborhood that we were developing in also realized that it was their building right mm -hmm. we we were just there to help them and the teachers blend into this amazing partnership and collaboration and so anyway the pro the project the the financing closes on the project um, and three months into construction, nine months before we finished, the apartments are fully leased. Wow. Um, by the time we finished the project, there was a waiting list of over 300 teachers waiting to get into this building. People were signing leases from like California on their way to Baltimore because wow. they had heard of this Center for Educational Excellence. And like our name wasn't on it. What happened was we didn't even do any marketing for it, right? There's no advertising dollars that could have bought that groundswell. What happened was that all these teachers who were part of the focus group from the beginning, they went out and they started telling their friends, they're never gonna believe this. There's this crazy developer out there 
we don't even actually like to think of ourselves as developer, but there's this crazy developer out there and they let us design our own apartments and they're dope. And like, <laughs> they let us choose our own rents and like, there's a fitness center and we have free parking and like, we're going to get to live together and cry together and laugh together, hold each other, keep each other in the classroom, which is the hardest thing in the world. And it just went viral, you know, and there was like an amazing feeling. It was our first project. Everybody told us that it wasn't something that we could do. Everybody told us that nothing would happen in the, in the neighborhood. And, you know, maybe the like culmination of all of that, because so many other amazing things have happened in that community was the day that President Barack Obama showed up to the little coffee shop on the corner of this building that we had created in a, again, in a part of town that everybody told us would never come to life. Um, and, you know, sitting there and watching the leader of the free world, this man that I just mm. like idolized walk in and just like melt everybody's heart with his charm and his, uh, intense presence is just an amazing moment. Wow. That is amazing. How is it doing now? What, uh, you know, and what are you thinking about, you know, considering COVID? I know we'll get back to hopefully what life is going to look like next soon get to what life is going to look like next not get back to so i don't necessarily want to get back to um things but uh how is it how is the building now the space doing now and what are your thoughts around what seawall will look like in the future considering covid and quarantine and, and what things will look like yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, last year was a scary year, 2020, especially for real estate, right? Like, what does office space look like in the future? You know, most people weren't going into offices and still aren't today. What does apartment living look like? What does retail look and feel like with the amount of online options that we have today? And I think like, you know, we took a, a an intentional pause to understand how things were going to shake out. And we still don't understand them. But what we came out of 2020 with was a real, was just like deep gratitude and understanding for our role within this industry. Nothing we've ever done has been our idea, right? Um, and when you take on projects that are driven by the end users, right? The people that want to live and work in them and the communities that they're in, it's impossible to fail, right? Mm. These are things that people are literally real time asking for. Um, and real estate's tricky, right? It's challenging. You go in and it's always like the developer telling the neighborhood what it is that the developer's gonna do. And like, we've never been able to get, get down with that formula. It's like so foreign to us. Why would you tell a community what it needs? Let the community tell you what it is they need and you help them get it. That's right. So I feel like, you know, we're, I, th I feel like we're just like insulated um, because, you know, we're so driven by our purpose. We're so clear about our why um, and uh, we're helping other people realize their dreams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think as a result of all of that, um, you know, we're really excited for the work that's going to come. There are going to be changes. It's going to be done differently. Um, but we're really excited to help bring that to life. I'm, I'm curious about how you're excited about um, this next year. I, I, you, you had a small comment in your question to me. It was like, we can't go back to where we were. And to me, like COVID was like one of two things for people. It was either a terrible year, right? Or it was one of the like greatest years of their life. Um, uh, yeah. where, where do you fall into that? Yeah, that's a great question. I Look at that. We almost got to the end of the interview before you had to, before you decided to interview me. Uh, we, as I, <laughs> I knew it was coming. I'm like, he's going to probably ask me something at some point. We, uh, I love it. Um, it's absolutely one of the most transformational years of my life. And I'm a very spiritual person. I'm never not in a personal development, you know, uh, transition, transformation. But what's different about right now is remembering who you are and you know when things like a pandemic hit or you know i had to balance and i think i spoke about this a little bit on your podcast i had to balance how am i being affected and how how is my community being being affected and like you lead on right like like um i take leadership very seriously i take this this is my 
I feel like I'm living on purpose in my purpose and doing exactly what I was sent here to do. And that's an interesting place. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the thing that everybody says that they're striving for, right? Like, I'm gonna find my passion. I'm gonna find my purpose. And it's like, okay, found that. And now, how do I, how do I kind of divvy it up for where it needs to go and still understand how to prioritize myself? How do mm-hmm. I um, think about what I need to be saying, what to say when, uh, which, which, when everything you want to say, while, while you should have the freedom to say whatever you want to say, everything you want to say does not always push forward your passion or your purpose. And so thinking about how do I want this to happen? One of the things like my PR people, um, ask me like, are you okay with being on conservative networks? You know, are you okay with, you know, doing conservative news? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, cause I'm going to come to the, I'm going to come to the screen. I'm going to look exactly like this. I'm going to have colorful, a colorful shirt and colorful lipstick. And I'm going to have whatever I want to have as I come to that call. And we're going to talk about being human, right? Like we're going to talk about being human. And I think like that was one of the things that really came up for me when you were just talking about the, you know, the Mississippi burning experience kind of thing. And then talking about the, you know, looking at how you give ownership or transference of power or including people in the power dynamics that be around where they live. Um, it's just recognizing that we're human. Like, so I would say like in this last year, I'm feeling my humanness, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling that, um, there's, we made advances that had you asked me four years ago while I was building that TP in my living room, would I have dreamed that we would be partnering with Nike, Visa, that I would be going to the, you know, partner with Visa to give Super Bowl tickets away to black women, black and brown women businesses in Tampa as a celebration of their capacity to like taking a moment to increase their capacity through sell it, through being able to attend, you know, something that you typically would see happening in your city, but not go to, you know, like, like that, that there's, there's nothing better than how I feel right now about the work that we're able to do and how we got here. And, you know, I want founders to not discount the work that you did to even be prepared for this moment, um, even though we didn't know how the moment was gonna come, right? Unfortunately, yeah. this, what I call awakening, um, you know, happening as a result of, of a tragedy and or a few tragedies or a string of tragedies, um it's unfortunate and we mourn that and it's sometimes it's hard to figure out where you stop and say but this happened because of that you know this you know people wouldn't be doing bob if this didn't and sometimes you have to say like regardless of when the moment what the moment was for you it was your moment was going to come like our moment was going to come right and it's not to disregard the tragedy that is to also honor that to celebrate the fact that those tragedies are creating change in the world, similar to us talking about that Mississippi burning moment, right? Like changes in the world that nobody was really thinking about or could account for um, at first. So to see the level of awakening, you know, it, it, like I said, it just puts a whole new meaning on the on the hashtag stay woke, right? You know, now it's like, let's stay, like, let's not go back. I don't want to celebrate mediocre speeches and um, you know, I don't want to celebrate like what we used to be. I don't I, like seeking comfort kind of makes you want to grab the blanket you're familiar with. And, you know, I just wonder what, what is going to, what it would look like for us to not grab a blanket. Maybe we get up and put some new clothes on, you know, like, I, you know, there's just so many things that can happen. I'm so, I'm a serial optimist. I'm super optimistic. Um, at Black Girl Ventures, I'm, I'm now able to have conversations that I've always wanted to have about how even, you know, this podcast is sponsored by Spearing. They have been an amazing partner for us because they, exactly what you're talking about, they gave me the ownership 
over what how I want to talk to my community about finances. You know, how I want to talk to my community about, you know, like listening to you talk about real estate development and and equity and ownership in that way. Like license. So over this last year, I've gotten a huge amount of just license to say what I want to say and do what I want to say. I mean, I was taking that space anyway. Now you weren't going to, I wasn't going to not be hit. So to have, to be paid for it, you know, to be supported for it, to, to have that space is, I, I am, you know, now having to think about questions. So the quality of your questions determines the quality of your life. And the questions I'm asking myself it now are, well, what does it mean? What does it look like for you to be a priority? And what you've done with Seawall is say, no, 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 the needs of the community are the priority. We're gonna, the money will come, you know, like, like the money will be there, it will come, it will move, it will shake, it will do, you know, whatever it's gonna do <laughs> as its own force. <laughs> but how do we prioritize? the needs of the people all around us and what does that look like? And so that, that question has been interesting and I could tell you more stories, but that, <laughs> that, um, yeah, that's been interesting for me right now, to be honest, like how, you know, celebrating why there's still not a, enough change. Uh, Malcolm X was 39 when he was killed. Um, Martin Luther King was 39 when he was killed. I'm 39 now. I could I could not imagine that the work that I am doing for racial equity and economic justice would ever be challenged by my life. You know, like I, that I, I'm just so I'm thankful, and I feel blessed for the freedoms that be, even though they're not all that I want to see in the world. Um, and I also feel energetic about pushing for racial equity and economic justice. Mm. You know, and the yes and. Like, you know, I don't have to just be, you know, upset and angry. And again, going back to the, like you said, you can do something or you can act like it never happened. Right? So I don't have to be just angry. And I don't have to be just celebratory. I can be like, ooh, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't like that. And I celebrate these other pieces. So, I mean, we just, we just got a big partnership with Nike. I saw that. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, thank you. We're going to be putting murals across three cities to focus on changing the face of entrepreneurship. Like, what is that? Who, who gets to be an entrepreneur? Who is an entrepreneur? And I love like the work you're doing with black, with black developers around like, well, who gets to be a developer? Who gets to who gets to have this kind of apartment? Who gets to live in this kind of building? Who gets to like all of that? I love it. That's just so good. <laughs> you talked you talked about uh, anger there, and and I want to be very clear. Like anger anger can be incredibly helpful, right? We just have to understand how to channel it, you know, especially as leaders. Um, and we we're somewhat under a microscope. Mm -hmm. um, but like there should be anger in our lives. You know, there should be la a anger that comes to us on a daily basis. Um, it's just like how we channel it so that as a result of that anger, positive, inclusive, uh, forward progress begins to take place. Yeah. Well, you have the Larger Than, Larger Than Yourself podcast. You have the Larger Than Yourself book coming out, you know. What is Tebow doing next? Other than definitely trying to get back into Brazil. What? <laughs> what? Um, what do you? What do you have coming up? What are your? What are you thinking about the future? Look, I, I want to be like very clear. The most important thing, the most rewarding opportunity I have is to be a dad to two amazing young boys. They're nine and eleven right now. And they are at this age right now where they are sponges. I'm a superhero and they want to be with me all the time. Um, and, you know, I always talk about before having kids, how I always thought that it would be amazing to, and an honor to help shape the life of another human being. Mm. 
what I've realized along the way is that they shape our lives mm-hmm. way more than we shape theirs. Um, so that, and, you know, m- my relationship with my wife, um, which pushes me so far out of my comfort zone every single day, um, are the, 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 the ongoing things that I w- w- will always cherish. Right. Um, out- outside of that, we are only beginning to scratch the surface at seawall. We've been going for almost 15 years at that point, And we're begin. we're just now beginning to hit our stride. This is the first time we've ever within the last year or two that we've ever talked about what we've done. Right. Yeah, um, and, and, and I was on a podcast the other day, we were talking about the importance of telling your story. Right. So for the first 13, we, we just got our website last year after 14 years in business. We, and, and because like I didn't, I fought the website because if you wanted information on us, you could just Google Seawall and all these amazing articles would come up around like teacher housing and building charter schools and community driven development and all these things that have been so close to us. But what I realized was that um, you have to tell your own story or people start to tell your story for you. That's right. Um, And people were starting to say that Seawall development was this massive billion dollar fund out of New York city that existed to gentrify communities. Um, and so this started to come back to me and, uh, I, I, I realized that because we had never tried to tell our own story in any way, we just like heads down, doing the work, heads down, doing the work, um, f- completely rewarded and, f- and felt fulfilled by it. Um, but our inability to tell our own story led other peoples to create their own stories, however it best suited them. So, you know, we've been on this like really cool, quite humble quest to figure out the most appropriate way to tell our story. And now that's been great. Um, and the projects that we're working on now are so transformational um, that they are going to lead to so many more opportunities to continue this work that we're so passionate about. So, we are literally just getting started with this. Mm. Tell your own story. Larger than yourself. Timo, I really appreciate you for joining me today. This has been awesome. You, uh, I can always tell that you are a very spiritual person because you always have this like energy and glow that comes with talking to you. <laughs> so I just appreciate all the things you're doing. Uh, when is the book going to drop? So I, we can we can make sure we get it. Yeah, um, it's uh, sometime in late 2021. So, um, you know, maybe I'll call you up and we'll jump back on the show and talk about the book. A little totally bit more. should. All right. So everybody stay tuned for that. Was well, anything you want to leave people with? Um, you know, last words, piece of advice. Not last words. That sounds weird. Uh, <laughs> but piece of advice, um, things to think about. Shelly, I just wanted to thank you, you know, like, you know, we were connected a little under a year ago and I've been following your journey and you are this incredible inspiration and like beacon of hope. Um, uh, I love everything from the blue lipstick to the like <laughs> bright colors you always have to like the TP story that you told me to just like your ability to never give up. Um, so I am deeply inspired by you. Um, and uh, look forward to continuing to follow and support your work however we can. Thank you for what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate that so much. Yeah, for sure. So we will definitely keep in touch. Thanks for joining us, Disruptors, and congratulations. You have taken another step toward being friggin' amazing. Make sure you visit us at adoseofdisruption.com where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or via RSS feed. Rate and subscribe if you're all the way live. Rate and subscribe if you're all the way live. That's right. Tell a friend, rate and subscribe to keep us all the way live. Come back next week so we can disrupt some more shit.